Okay, so I want to make this kind of special podcast episode where I want to talk to all of the Jews and the Israelis that I know and who follow me. And what I want to talk to you about is about how you talk to people, how you talk on social media about the conflict. And my goal is to te- to, to, to kind of help you see a better way of communicating what's going on and help you avoid some really, really, really big mistakes that I think a lot of people are making that are making it harder for other people to understand some of the nuance of this conflict and to understand the Israeli side, okay? So, like, I'm in a weird position. I'm, I'm one of those people who straddles two cultures, okay? I, I was brought up in rural Britain. I had never met a Jew in my life, not knowingly, until I met my husband at 21. I knew nothing about Jewish culture. I didn't really care about Jewish culture and Judaism. It just wasn't, you know, there were Muslims and and Hindus and Sikhs around me, but like like Judaism just, it, it, it felt like something that was completely irrelevant. But at the same time, I was also brought up in a culture that was very, very, very clear that anti-Semitism is not acceptable. And we grew up with, um, uh, all of the stories of the Holocaust were taught it in school and people understand that on some level um, and it's con- it is considered to be the worst horror of the 20th century but at the same time it just doesn't feel very relevant in our lives because there just aren't any Jews right there, there's Jews make up a tiny percentage of the British population and they live in in in, in groups in around the country and in communities around the country like in london manchester like in the big cities they don't grow they, they don't sort of you know i had one black friend at school but like there's there there aren't any um and and there was a very small black population where i grew up but there weren't any jews at all and and and, and that's hard i think for some jews to sort of get their head around and so what I, I, I'm, I'm in this very strange position where not many people are like me, where you really straddle two cultures. I've come from that culture um, and I moved to Israel when I was 22. I married an Israeli Jew. I have then, over the past 14 years, become more and more and more entrenched in this culture. I've I've done gyor, I've done a, a conversion. My children are brought up as Jewish, but I still see, I, I, I and, and I'm starting to see, I also live in a, I don't live in like Medinat Tel Aviv. I don't live in like the state of Tel Aviv, right? I, I'm not in this cosmopolitan area. I'm in this very rural part of Israel and probably a lot more exposed to Israelis and the Israeli mentality than most new immigrants to Israel. So I'm in this, I'm in a very strange place where I understand what it feels like to be from outside of this culture and have no idea what it involves. But I've also then completely adopted a new culture, but I still remember what it was like to be not in that culture. And what I want to talk to you about in this podcast is about how to bridge that gap between those kinds of people and how to help take them on a journey from A to B to understanding some of the Israeli perspective or the Jewish perspective of this culture. And I think, and I say this with love, so you know, don't, don't take this badly, but I think a lot of you are doing a really shitty job of doing that. And I'm gonna explain why in this podcast, and I'm gonna talk about the ways I think that you can help spread knowledge about the Israeli side of this conflict um, more effectively. And I also wanna say like, this is a PR war that's going on right now. We have the actual war that's going on, but then we have this PR war that's going on and is being fought and the, the sort of the the Palestinian whatever side of this has some slogans that are just regurgitated and are very 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 catchy and well known, 
that that isn't so true on the Israeli Jewish side of things. Like, I mean, things like Am Israel Chai, like nobody is saying that outside of the outside of you know the world's Jew- jewelry it's just it's not happening um so like we have to uh, uh, what i want to kind of try and get across in this podcast is that like we're not going to win on that sort of slogan front we, you need to be able to present the israeli side of things to people in a way that they can understand and let me just define those people that you want to appeal to for a second right because like all of the Jews and the Israelis that you know, right? You don't need to appeal to them. You don't need to explain to them what's going on. They're already on your side, right? It, you've already got, you've already won those people over. So you don't need to talk to them. There's also all of the Muslims and um, sort of uh, Arab sympathizers around the world, the progressive left in the West for the large part, it is fully on the Palestinian side, right? You're never, ever, ever going to convince them. But then there's this whole group of people in the middle who are looking at what's going on on their TV screens. And they, they, they know that they're not, they don't understand the conflict. And they know that there's more complexity to it. And they know that a lot of slogans are getting thrown around. But they're sitting there going, I feel like there's too much missing. I don't really know what's going on. And I don't know how to take a side the, all of these slogans and chants are all very sort of like, you know, compelling and they seem to have a lot of passion, but they're not, they, they, they're not they're painting a full picture to me. Like, you know, free, Pal- a lot of people have asked me, for example, what does free Palestine mean? Who are they freeing them from? Like, or, or you know, free Palestine from the river to the sea. Like, wait, but what does that mean? Does that mean that you get rid of Israel? Like, is Israel not a country? Are Israel colonizers? Like, what's, like, what, what's going on? They, they sort of see that they're only getting pieces of the puzzle and they want to know more they genuinely want to know more but you really have to and this is why I explained who I who who where I come from you really have to understand like where the average westerner is kind of watching in disbelief sort of feeling like wow this looks so fucked up and it, it, like I've like this is all blowing up again and why is it blowing up and what's going on and they don't necessarily they don't have a dog in the fight they might feel more lean more one way to the other but more than anything else they just feel like there's a lot of missing context and they don't really understand what's going on and those are the people these kind of moderate level-headed intelligent people in the middle who want to know more but the information that's available is so so inaccessible to them and they are the people that you want to appeal to and you learn this in business right i have like I, I you know in a business like mine there are those who they already love you they're true fans they're all that you don't have to convince them right there's the ones who hate you there's the ones that want to do detoxes and want to do like juice cleanses and want to be ve- want to be vegans and they're never ever ever going to listen to me. But then there's a whole bunch of sort of moderates in the middle who are open to what I say. Um, so and this applies here too. So you've got to remember who you're talking to and who you're trying to win because you're not trying to win over people on either extreme. You're trying to win over the moderates in the middle who are. Who, who have sympathy for what's going on in Israel, but lack understanding and context. And just one thing before I launch into my kind of four points of things I think you guys need to do better on social media. I also want to talk about the nature of social media, right? The, it's like this conflict is, it, it's very, what we've seen in the past sort of couple of years is things like, me too things like the whole blm stuff that went that kicked off corona covid and this and and it's so blown up um over social media and so accessible via, via social media and everyone can post about it everyone can talk about it that, that what happens with these sorts of conflicts and these sorts of events 
over social media is very similar to what happens in nutrition and 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 everything else right the, there's a very there's always a very 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 small percentage of extremely loud extremely obnoxious obnoxious people right and we see this a lot on the progressive left right the far left whether it's around environmentalism or whether it's around uh, black lives matter whether it's I'm probably going to get cancelled for saying that whether it's around um uh, what's going on right now, there is always a group of extremely loud people who have zero tolerance policy to any other um, way of looking at things and who make a lot, a lot, extremely passionate, they're extremely angry and they make a lot of noise on social media. And it gives the impression that everyone thinks like that because they're so loud. And you see the same thing in nutrition and exercise. They're so, so, so loud and they drown everyone else out. And you end up with this situation where because they are dominating the conversation, if you're somebody who you have to have like a really big pair of balls to speak out against them because it, and you have to be really like it's usually the the extremists on the other side who speak out against them because they're the ones who feel passionate and angry enough to say something in the meantime there's all these moderate people in the middle who will look at comments and look at posts and go oh my god like this is so extreme this is so over the top but I'm not going to be the one that jumps in and says something because I'm going to get my head bitten off. And then occasionally you get somebody who's, you know, level headed and sensible who then says something. They get their head bitten off by 20 angry, you know, like the mummy mob or something, you know, like yeah, exclusive breastfeeding, blah, 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 like natural birth. Blah, blah, blah. And then, you know, one sensible person comes in and says, OK, but how about this exception? And then they get torn to pieces. Then they go, bloody hell, I'm not doing that again. I'm not going to put myself out there again. And uh, other people see them getting attacked. Other moderate people see them getting attacked. And they're like, oh, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I'm, I'm not going to be like, be, have that done to me. So I'm just going to stay out of it. Right. And most, the, the, and this is the problem with social media is it amplifies in this way. It amplifies extreme voices. And then those voices in the middle of people who are moderate, who are thinking about the nuance, who are sort of going, hang on, what about this? What about that? They, their voices get completely drowned out and they get shouted down and you don't get to speak. And so you have this, situa this crazy situation in which 80% of people are not being represented with their more moderate views, but the 10% on either side are getting over, over representation from their extreme views. And it's really important to understand that that is how social media is working right now as well. Okay, so I want to move on to sort of like the, the four big sort of mistakes and how to correct them that I think a lot of Jews and Israelis are making. And I'm allowing myself to say this as a kind of outsider. I, I get, hopefully I've got my honorary Jew badge by now, but like, um, I get, I, I feel like I can say certain things that other people can't. So I'm saying this with love, a bit of tough love, but I really want you to take this on board and think about how you're communicating this to the, non, the, the, the vast majority of non-Jews that are out there that are sympathetic to the Israeli cause. So first of all, symbolism, right? I get it, right? It's, it feels like a really good thing to do to change your profile picture into a Star of David that says, I stand with Israel. I get it. But if, if you're, if, the, the reason why that is really pointless is because other Jews and other Israelis immediately go, oh, great, she's on our side. Awesome. But again, they aren't the people that need convincing. It also signals, obviously, to the 10% on the other side that hate you. But then what it signals to that 80% in the middle that you have a chance of talking to is it's kind of like it's too in your face kind of symbolism. Like it's it, like the, the, the Star of David doesn't mean very much to people who aren't Jewish. And like the the reason why I say that is because again I come from that culture. The Star of David meant nothing to me. It didn't move me in any way. I was just uh, the other day I was driving out of my moshav and they've put up all these like uh, Israeli flags, and it really made me feel um, very like proud and patriotic, and it gave me a sense of sort of like you know belonging. 
this is after 14 years of being here, right? But when I go back to like the first few years that I was here, you know, when Israeli flags were waved and when, um, and when the Hatikva was sung, it, it like, I could appreciate, I could see that it meant a lot to other people, but it didn't touch me in any way. And, and, and that's not because I'm anti, I was anti-Semitic. It's not because I didn't like Israel. It's just because it, 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 it's very hard. Those like, just like if I were to see, I don't know, a Ugandan flag, it doesn't mean anything to me. It doesn't move me. And what you do by put plastering Star of David everywhere is that you kind of just make people think, oh, well, they're obviously any moderate in the middle. Well, that it's obviously that person, like that person's obviously, I know what their opinions are already. It, like, and it kind of like, say, for example, if they're going through your stories and they're going through stories and then the first thing they see in your story is a star of David. I saw, I've seen a few people share now, um, like this kind, this kind of square with like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of tiny little stars of David's like and that's the first thing they share in their stories and it's like who is this for what is this going to get you like all this does is it signals to other Jews like you're gonna I stand with Israel you're gonna like the rest of my content but if I'm a non-Jew coming into this and trying to understand the situation I'm just gonna be like oh god I don't want to be overloaded with symbolism and sound bites again so they just will leave the story and they're the people that you want in your stories you need to be able to you need to be able to present something right off the bat that gives them a reason to read and to take note and to listen and plastering it with symbolism doesn't help that it, it just puts people off and you might say well well you know it's really out of order that it puts people off but you would be put off as well if it was a cause that you're not familiar with and you want to learn more but you don't want to just hear all of the sound bites from the other side and be blasted by things and and similar with with things like i keep seeing hashtag am israel chai who is this for like seriously guys think about it for a second People, you know, all of that, that those 80% of people, moderates in the middle, they're not going through their Instagram looking for hashtag Am Israel Chai. They don't even know what that means. Like, so you're just by using that, you're not going to reach anyone who isn't already well and truly in that echo chamber already. Like, they are, you, you're only going to be sharing with other people who have the exact same beliefs as you. And that doesn't help because it doesn't help anyone else understand where we're coming from. And the other side has lots of slogans, right? All the free Palestine, from the river to the sea, blah, blah, like, and, and you know, it's open air prison, occupation, any occupation, like all this stuff. They have very, very strong slogans. And I'm not... I'm not, I'm, I'm not saying they don't, right? But, and, and that isn't, that was obviously convincing for some people, but most moderate people in the middle, they're going, well, what do you mean free Palestine? Free Palestine from who? Like, what do you mean about the occupation? Is Israel occupying uh, the Palestinians? Like, like, people are interested asking those questions, at least intelligent people are asking those questions. And we aren't going to win them over with slogans like, Am Israel Chai, like they're not, they're not going to, that's not going to mean anything to them, right? So like you have to, you have to, like rule number one of marketing is that you have to meet people where they're at, right? I do this all the time in my, in my business, in nutrition and training, right? Understanding what people understand and what they don't understand, and then taking them on a journey from A to B, taking them on a journey from what they understand to understanding a bit of what I know, right? Because they're not gonna understand it all. You just, you just gotta get them a few steps in the right direction, but you gotta meet people where they're at. And where people are at is not wor worshiping Star of David, and it's not worshiping the Israeli flag, and it's not worshiping slogans like Am Israel Chai. The second big mistake I think that a lot of people are making is that a lot of you are calling people out. And calling people out does not help. I get it. Like, it's also something that I've also learned over the years is that like a lot of Jewish people, a lot of Israelis have a bit of a chip on their shoulders. 
But this is not the way coming into it really emotional and attacking people is not the way you're going to win people over. So let me give you a couple of examples of calling people out. So so one really common thing, and we've seen this through other trends over the past few years, is saying, if you're silent, then you are part of the problem. Or if you are silent, da, 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 like, like having a go at like saying, if you're not saying something, if you're not plastering all over your Instagram support for our side, then you are part of the problem, basically. And this is such a logical fallacy. It's so, so, so wrong. And even if that was correct, you saying things like that means that the people who are being silent because they don't know what to say and they don't know enough about the situation, people who are being silent but who are curious, you're going to cause them to shut down, right? Because they, they, they don't, they don't they, they, you're not going to convince them ever to be one of the extremists. You're not going to ever convince them to walk around waving an Israeli flag, but you might convince them that Israel has a moral standpoint here and and is and and, and is and, and and that there are there is a case for Israel and that we have a right to exist and that we are doing everything we can um, to prevent human human lives being lost. I've received so many messages, so many messages, and maybe I need to share them on my Instagram more, of people who are saying I know, like, I, I, I'm horrified seeing what's going on, but, you know, we, like, we support Israel and we're sort of, we're seeing what's happening from the side and it's absolutely horrible to see what's going on. And I've had people tell me, you know, it's really hard to share anything on social media because you'll just get shouted down. Because remember that 10%, right, of like really extreme keyboard warriors, they are, they want blood. They're going to get you cancelled. They're going to shut down your account. They're going to go for, they are going to go, gung-ho and they're going to try and ruin your life if you say anything that so people actually do have to um do have to watch themselves with what they say they can get themselves in a lot of trouble and it is really 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 hard when there's so much fervor on the on the Palestinian side it is really hard for somebody who's never met a Jew in their life who doesn't know anything about Judaism who doesn't know anything about Israel it's and, and they've got people in their feed posting things about free Palestine it's very hard for them to make a post mainly because ab about Israel mainly because they don't know what to say. They, they feel like they don't know enough about the situation to have an opinion and to say something. And then when they see posts by you saying like, you know, if you're, if you're silent, da, 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 da. And I've had, I've had messages from people because I've tried to say in my, in my um, stories, I've tried to say, you know, um, there's a lot of people who are supporting us and who see what's going on, but, um, even if they're not saying anything. And I've had Jews and Israelis attack me and say, it's not good enough. They're the, they're part of the problem. They need to be speaking up. They need to do this. It's like, da, 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 da. And it's like, you're just coming from a very, very, very emotional place right now. And if you say that to those people, those people are going to go, oh, well, I won't even bother then. I'll just turn my TV off. Like, my life is unaffected. I'm just going to carry on as usual. Why should I care? Like, you've got to, like, if if people give you a little bit, I think there's a kind of, like, there's that culture in Judaism of sort of pushing people away, making them prove it as well. Like, you know, with conversion, it's like, you're, you're supposed, they're supposed to turn you down twice. And then the third time they say, like, okay, okay, yeah, I'll let you convert. And it's like a, it's like a thing. And I think there is that kind of attitude sometimes with, with, um, with Jews and within Judaism is sort of like, you need to, you need to really work for it, but most people aren't going to really work for it. If you bite their heads off and push them away. And if you, if they give you often, what I see is people saying something, but then being shut down and they're like, oh, well, I won't bother then, right? I've had my head bitten off. Why, like, why would I make an effort to say any more? I saw one post of someone sort of like sharing an email that they were sent and the person was like, you know, I'm really sorry to see what's going on in Israel, um, but um, I really hope you and your family are well. And then the person went and plastered it all over their social media and said, like, this is what not to say. We don't need reminding of what's going on. Just don't bother emailing us. And it's like, this is the exact sort of problem, right? People are trying to reach out and show that they care. And they're, 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 they are reaching out 
to kind of bridge that gap in some way and show you that they're thinking about you. And then not only do they get their head bitten off, but they get shamed on social media for not saying the right thing. And it's like, that is not the way to get people on your side. That is going to make that person shut down and say, right, I'm never going to bother again. And then any non-Jew that sees that post is going to be like, God, I'm definitely not going to reach out to anyone that I know. Meanwhile, all the Jewish people that they do know are saying, your Jewish friends are not okay. You need to reach out to them. But they're getting mixed messages from people. Like, and, and again, and, and that also saying your Jewish friends are not okay. You need to reach out to them. is also quite an aggressive way of saying it. It's like, like you're, it, there, there are ways of like sort of saying it more softly saying, you know, we're really struggling. It, any, if you reach out to your Jewish friends and ask them if they're okay and show them that you care, it will mean the absolute world to them. Like if you word it that way, you, know, you get more flies with honey than you do with vinegar like you you even though you're angry and even though you're upset don't take it out on the people who care and who want to show you some empathy and caring i also saw a post at one point um somebody saying for those of you who actually had the decency to reach out and ask if i'm okay here's what you can do and this kind of language, like there's absolutely no need for saying who had the decency to. You can easily just say, for those of you who reached out to ask if I'm okay, here's a cause you can donate to, or here's a thanks so much for caring, right? That is going to make people go, some people go, okay, great, like now I know where I can donate or what I can do or where I can go. But as soon as you say th language like, for those of you who had the decency to even ask if I'm okay, it's such aggressive language that does two things. It tells the people who asked if you were okay, it, instead of appreciating it and saying thank you for reaching out to me in this way, and, and thank you for caring. I really appreciate it. It really means a lot to know I've got your support. You're, you're saying you've done the bare minimum. You don't get any thanks or appreciation because you've just done the bare minimum. And then what and, and then what and then and then the ones who haven't yet reached out to ask if you're okay, maybe because they don't know what to say, maybe because, you know, like they're 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 a bit um like they're a bit worried about what's gonna, if there's any backlash or saying the wrong thing. Remember, we're talking about like Americans, British people, like we don't know how to reach out. Like pe people of those cultures, they don't know that it's not in their culture to sort of reach out. It's, it's their culture to leave people alone and let them give them some space. And they don't know how to reach out. But what that sort of language tells them is that, oh, well, I'm not gonna bother now doing that. That's like, that's just gonna, like, why should I, why should I even bother? Because if I didn't ask before and they just see that as just having like basic decency, if I ask now, they're just going to see it as even worse because like I'm asking too late. And again, like you've, you've got people who are like showing that they are on your side, even if it's in very small ways. And then you're choosing language that shuts them down, makes them feel shit about themselves and pushes them away rather than bringing them an extra inch closer to you because that's all you can do. You can't make them avid Israel like lovers. All you can do is you can bring them that extra inch towards you and make them feel, you know, more sympathy and love and 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 caring towards you. Okay, the third big mistake is using emotional arguments. So let me give you a, a rather than using rational arguments and reiterating the main point. So let me give you a couple of examples because a lot of you have sent me messages saying, "Oh, my colleague sent me this." And then this is what I sent in response, right? Like uh, my colleague sent me this pro-Palestine thing or my colleague said posted this and this is what I said in response, right? And a lot of you are making really terrible mistakes, like terrible debating mistakes in your response when you're talking to these sorts of people. Remember, these are also not people that you're necessarily going to convince because they're on the other extreme. But if you get it in the right way, you can plant seeds of doubt. You can start to get them to at least see the other side. So let me give you a couple of concrete examples. Um, one of you sent me a, a message of, of um, or that your colleague had sent you something 
saying something along the lines of, look at what you're doing to Gaza, you're killing Gazan babies, you're, you're bombing the shit out of Gaza, blah, 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 blah. And then the response was, what are we supposed to do? Just sit back, just sit back and let Hamas kill us all. It, this isn't a good argument, right? This isn't going to convince anyone. What you need to say instead is, Israel are not try they are not trying to kill innocent civili civilians. This isn't collective punishment. Israel are trying to kill specific Hamas targets, but because they are hiding behind the civilian population of Gaza, it is impossible for us to kill them without killing innocent lives because they are being used as human shields. Right? This is a much more compelling argument for somebody on the other side who's saying, look at all these dead Gazan babies, look at the, these entire like areas that, are, that have been flattened. Right? turning around and saying, well, what are we supposed to do? It, it's, 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 it, it's kind of, because you're I implicitly agreeing with the fact that yes, we're just out there killing innocent civilians. That's what we're doing. And what else are we supposed to do? And that is not what's happening. It's not, the f it's not factual and it's not something that is going to convince anyone. You have to keep reiterating the point that Israel are trying to dismantle and destroy Hamas and all of its infrastructure and they are hiding behind innocent civilians. Like that is the argument to be made whenever it's, whenever people talk about Israel killing innocent civilians, that is the point to keep coming back to, right? And being consistent with that and keep coming back to that. You've got to try to avoid, I know we're all emotional, but you've got to try to avoid emotional reasoning in this case, because they don't care about your emotions. They don't care how you're feeling. You've got to bring it back to cold, hard facts and logic. Another really clear example is that somebody said, my colleague sent me a message saying, it's not true that they beheaded babies. It's not true that they've raped any women. This is all just, Zionist propaganda, it didn't actually happen, blah, 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 blah. And their response was, like, I know people who are involved, like, who have seen it with their own eyes, um, and that is enough evidence for me. That's all I need to know, because these people wouldn't lie. That is so not a compelling argument at all for somebody who's saying, no, it's all lies. It's all lies and prop propaganda, Israeli propaganda. That's not going to convince anyone. You, you need to say things that are much more con concrete, like... Uh, we have we have hundreds of people, entire teams clearing up the 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 bodies and the the desecrated bodies that have been left. We have picture we have photographic evidence of it. But beyond uh, beyond that, Hamas literally went into this with a go with GoPros on their head, filmed it, uploaded it to the internet, sent it far and wide, sent it to the families of the people that they were executing, they made sure that the whole world knew about this. Um, they, 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 they advertised what they were doing. They showed the world what they were doing. And now we have, we, we have the international press that are here and they are witnessing with their own eyes, you know, the dead bodies and what exactly what they did to them, the, the, the people that they beheaded, uh, the people that they raped, the people that, the, the pregnant women who they cut open and took the babies out of them. Like we, we have, it's not just Israelis saying, like, these are the reporters from around the world reporting on this and seeing this with their own eyes like you don't need to take some IDF soldier's word for it right that's not going to be convincing to somebody on the other side this it's much more convincing to explain the people who have seen it um and 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 uh, like relay that point really really strongly and repetitively and the final thing number 4 that i'm seeing is a lot of simplistic narratives and denying of the other side. Now, I, I, I am. It's, we've got to be careful here because it's it's so hard for us after what's happened to see the pain of other people. 
right? And I'm not, I am, what I'm not saying is that they had a reason to do it. They, it, it they're, they're justified in their reasons to do it. I'm not saying that, but we can't just pretend that there isn't another side to this. And we can't resort to simplistic narratives. The fact of the matter is, is that like, there are certain things um, like the settlements that have caused a lot, a lot, a lot of issues. The fact that Palace, the, the Gazan situation, I do not agree that it's an open air prison. I do not agree that it's under Israeli occupation. And I think the world has to hold Hamas accountable for what they've done to those two and a half million people living there in Gaza. But we don't want to become like them and completely deny the other side's pain. You know, right now, a lot, a lot, a lot of people are dying in Gaza. They have it's complete chaos, complete hysteria. Children are dying. It is awful what's happening there. Does that mean that I don't think we should be doing it? Absolutely not. It, we absolutely have to dismantle Hamas. There's no way around it. But it, we can't just deny the other side's pain and deny that any that that, that they're feeling anything at all. Um, and they, they have, a, the problem is, I know they have a lot of extreme claims and extreme um, sort of aims as well that you just can't like accept. But we don't want to fall into the same trap of overly simplistic narratives and um, just, you know, cutting out details. We want to keep this nuanced and we need to keep talking about it from a nuanced perspective. Okay, after recording the podcast, I realized there's something else that I want to say. So I'm just going to jump in here to add this little bit. Um, and that is to say that um, when it comes to like simplistic narratives and denying the other side, like denying that the other side is going through any pain or that there's any um, anything that Israel has ever done wrong, um, it can be really, really, really hard for us to do. But I think that all it does when you're thinking about the moderates is when they see, you know, Gazan children being pulled out of the rubble and then Israelis saying like, oh, well, you know, it's all their fault. Like, it, like, we have, like we've got nothing to do with it or like, you know, it's not really happening or, or whatever else. It just makes people have less sympathy for the Israeli side. It does. People aren't blind. People can see what's going on. So again, you have to use those like really concrete arguments of like ham the goal is to kill Hamas. Hamas are hiding behind their civilians, and this is why Gazans are dying. Um, like there isn't Israel doesn't have another option. They can't just let Hamas just keep on existing. Um, but there's no other way when they hide behind their own civilians as human shields. And some people sort of feel like giving the other side any sort of um wiggle room saying anything on the other side like you know criticizing um israel's policy towards settlements over the past few years or by you know uh, criticizing some things that israel has done or by acknowledging that what is happening now in gaza is absolutely horrible it feels like you're giving um we don't want a lot of people don't want to say it because it feels like you're giving power to the other side but when you deny that all it does is it makes people have less sympathy for us and it makes people think well you're not seeing the other side at all and it makes us look willfully blind and that is and a lot of people on the pro palestine side are willfully blind and people can see that so we can't also be willfully blind we ha with overly simplistic narratives um, and pretending that the the, the ways that Gazans are suffering is not happening. We have to acknowledge that because that's the common humanity that we have that they don't have that ultimately plays to our advantage. Um, I understand it's a difficult thing to do because it does feel like, you know, you give them one finger, they'll take the whole hand, you know, as you say in, in, in Hebrew, or you give them an inch, they'll take a mile. And they will. Um, and that's that's the that's part of the asymmetry in this war, the physical war and also this PR war that's being fought. But we still have to acknowledge their humanity, acknowledge their suffering, and acknowledge their pain. Otherwise, we come across as just as inhumane and just as barbaric as they do. Um, and that isn't going to appeal to 
to those moderate masses who you have to remember, they don't know conflict, they don't know violence, they don't know existential threat, they only know peace and peace with neighbors and cooperation with other countries and wars are things that happen over there in some other place with you know really um people who don't understand how the modern world works you so you have to appeal to their common humanity as well if you want them on your side one final thing i want to add is i've seen a lot of criticism on the jewish israeli side about tokenism and using Jews as tokens, you know, the ultra orthodox, like anti Zionist ones, um, and, and then being used and weaponized by the other side as like, here, here we are, here you go, here are Jews that are against Israel, um, as well as sort of the more liberal progressive Jews that are against Israel and pro Palestine. Um, I really do understand this argument and I also feel really uncomfortable with the other side's use of tokenism. Um, but it's kind of a difficult one because don't we also kind of do the same? I mean, a son of Hamas is a great example. The guy that wrote the book that was, you know, that was brought up within Hamas. And we use him as an example. And there are other examples of Arabs who speak out against Hamas um, that we also use on our side. And also, aren't I kind of a token? I mean, I'm not, I, did, I wasn't brought up Jewish. Um, and yet here I am with a very pro-Israeli stance. So I don't know, it's just something to be wary of. I don't really know what the right answer is here because um, I, I do think it's a powerful argument to say, look, this guy who you know used to be a politician for the, the Palestinian Authority, he condemns Hamas. It, it, and, and I also realize how powerful voices like mine are in this fight it it, it 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 makes a lot it's a much it's a much more appealing argument to somebody who's not jewish and hasn't been brought up jewish hearing a non-jew speak about it but i think it's more because of my perspective and being able to bridge that gap between their knowledge and value system and the, and the israeli one um I think that's why it is, is more powerful than anything else. But I, I just wanted to put that out there because I think it's a bit of a contentious topic. I don't really have a solution for it, but we do need to be careful about calling out tokenism, um, especially if like the next slide on your stories is, is, is using a, an Arab to do exactly the same. So just to kind of summarize my main points is that my, the main point that I'm trying to get across is that you are not going to be able to convince everyone um, of Israel being in the right here. But there is a huge number, and, 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 and you are exposed to all of the anti-Semitic stuff, all of like, like all Jews and Israelis right now are in a, an echo chamber of very pro-Israel stuff on the one side and very, very, very awful anti-Semitic stuff that's happening on the other side. But there's so much that's happening in the world right now and so many people who like feel like they don't have a dog in the fight. They want to understand more um, and they have sympathy towards Israel. And those are the people, but they know nothing about the situation, right? Those are the people you need to focus on and you need to have razor sharp focus on those people right because like again it goes back to marketing in in my job i have to focus on those people that i can help that are open to my help um but that aren't quite sold yet right i don't want to keep selling to the same people who are like true fans right? that doesn't help me i won't get more sales i won't make more money right then there's all the people that can't stand me can't stand my personality can't stand my views can't stand uh, my methods, think that, you know, the true way is like, I don't know, keto or whatever, they're never going to listen to me. So there's no point trying to convince them. You have to identify the people that you're talking to. And you've got to have razor sharp focus on these people who are moderates, reasonable people in the middle, want to learn more, don't know how to learn more because there's just this PR war going on over their heads and none of it makes any sense to them. You have to focus on them and you have to try to share perspectives and narratives and stories 
that are simple and that can help them get from where they are and inch their way to where you want them to be. And you can't get pissed at them for not go driving a mile in your direction, right? They're gonna they 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 they're gonna take little tiny steps one in one direction or another one tiny step at a time in each direction very very cautious cautiously um, and that's all you can expect of people um so treat them with kindness because if they're already on your side you shouting them down you telling them they're not doing enough you telling them uh making them out to be bad people is going to make them completely shut off to your cause you blasting them with jewish symbolism and ideology is not going to get them over to your uh, over to your cause, but being rational and calm and presenting things in a way that they can understand. And I understand that's hard for a lot of you as well, especially those of you who grew up either in Israel or in a very tight Jewish community. It's hard to see where other people are uh, and, and, and how they view it and how to how to grab them, take them along that, that journey. Hopefully, I've been able to help you bridge that gap a little bit um, from sharing my perspective from having been there and now being here. Um, let me know your thoughts. Let me know if you have any questions. Let me know if there's anything you would add to that. Um, let me know. I'm really interested to hear it.